I have been doing Power BI consulting for the last six or seven years. And in this video, I'd like to talk about a few of my mistakes and my experiences in order to make outstanding Power BI reports. These ideas that I'm going to speak about are going to be not only just visualization ideas or improving your visualizations, but also about DAX, modeling and Power Query. All right, let's make some outstanding reports. All right, the first one, think modeling first. I cannot imagine to tell you that how important is this. Let's just say that you had handed off some data and you handed off some requirements and you have to build a report. What is the first thing that you do? If your answer is that the first thing that I do is start loading the data into Power BI and start building the relationship, that is where you're making a mistake. The very first thing that I tend to do is then I draw out a rough model of the entire data. When I say model, what do I mean by that? I mean to say that I decide on what the fact tables are going to be, what the dimension tables are going to be, how am I going to link the columns, what is going to be the granularity of the tables, how many columns do I want to keep in all those tables. I even lay down the logic of complicated calculations that I do not have the answer to right at the start. And typically the tool that I use in order to draw my data models is draw.io. It's a brilliant online software that I use almost in all the models. I draw out my relationships, I connect the tables, and I create a mock of how the model is going to look like. That is going to give me a lot of clarity as to how do I even have to start to clean the data or think about calculations when I'm actually building the model. Now, this is not a sponsored video. I'm not trying to promote this particular tool. You can draw the model on a piece of paper. You can draw that in PowerPoint. You can obviously use this tool that I have just suggested, be it any tool, but having a clear sense of what the model is going to look like, the granularity of the tables, the relationships, the star schema is absolutely important. And I will urge you from your next report onwards, think about modeling first and then you go ahead and start to do anything with Power BI. Idea number two, insights over design. Let me pick up an example to help you understand what do I mean by that. Let's just say that you're calculating a metric and the metric is new customers. Now, if you have done the calculation and the very first thing that you end up doing is to start thinking about how do I present that on the screen, that's the mistake. Because the questions that you will be asking yourself are going to be extremely shallow questions, meaning, what should be the color of the chart or what should be the color of the card? Should I put a shadow at the behind of the card visual or not? These are extremely shallow questions. I would rather recommend that you first finish off enhancing the insights of the visual of the dashboard of the report. What do I mean by that? Let's just pick up the same thing, number of customers. Now, number of customers can be paired with multiple synonymous insights to enhance the value of that insight. For example, number of customers can be paired along with how has been the consistency of the new customers in the last three months? The customers that we have acquired in the last three months, have they been spending almost the same amount of money? That is going to be a high quality metric. You can also pair that along with, let's say, a threshold or a benchmark. That means how much minimum do I want my customer to spend in terms of his footfall and also in terms of its money or share of the pocket that he is going to be qualified as a good customer. So now you're looking at number of new customers acquired, the consistency of those customers and a minimum threshold that we have spent on those customers as well. Now, if you start to now think about that, what can be the design to highlight the relevant parts of these three paired metrics, your dashboard is going to start to touch new heights. So always start to think about insights first and then come up with ways to design those insights to make your analysis stand out. Insights first, then the design. Okay, quick interruption in the video. If you're enjoying the video so far, you're going to absolutely love my courses on Power BI, DAX, modeling, M language. These are hard courses, more advanced courses, which is where I teach the users how to think about the problem, lay out the logic first, understand the principles of solving the problem in Power BI, and then start building the solutions of your own. Once you understand how the underlying principle or fundamental works, you'll then be able to take the same concept and even apply that to your own problems in Power BI. Hundreds of students have joined the courses and they have benefited a lot. I'm gonna leave a link to the course in the description of the video and you should definitely take a look at that. The second thing is that I have started a new consulting business. It's not a new business, but then I have formed a new company, which is where we are taking consulting projects on Excel and on Power BI. If you have a need to get a project done up and running, I would highly recommend that you take a look at our consulting page and do reach out to us in case you have any project for us. 
Thanks, let's just get back to the video. After you've thought about the model and you've thought about the insights, the next thing that you end up doing in Power BI is start to clean or ETL the data using Power Query. And the very first thing that I would recommend you to do in Power Query is stage your queries. What do I mean by that? Let's just say that if you're having to connect to a folder, now that should be one particular query. Just connect to the folder, scan the relevant files, and I don't really want you to clean all the data in that particular query, but you can stage that into the next query, which is where you can start to clean the data in the next query, which is referenced to your home query, which connects to the folder. And then through that staging, you can actually have your fact tables, your dimension tables, all laid out in the nice stage, and then you can end up loading the data. The staging is going to enhance the clarity of the model and also perhaps bring more efficiency in the data cleaning process. The next thing that I will highly recommend you to do is check for query folding. If you're happening to connect to a data source, which is let's say a SQL data source, then as much transformation as you can push it to the data source, you should try to do that. How do you check for query folding? That means are the steps in Power Query being taken back to the native language or SQL language and they're being processed in the database level rather than in the Power Query level? How do you check for that? Just simply right click on any particular step and take a look at view native query. If you're seeing the native query, that means the query folding is happening. If you're not seeing that, the query folding has broken and you should do now some work to enable query folding once again, maybe rejuggle the steps, do something else so that the query folding doesn't break. The two other things that I will highly recommend you do in Power Query when you're creating your queries is start to create folders and start to take notes for your queries. Foldering helps you organize all the queries in different buckets. So you can have, let's say, a folder for all the fact queries. You can have a folder for all your dimension queries. You can have a folder for all your source queries. You can have a folder for all your custom functions that you have built all together. So if you actually folderize this, it just organizes the entire query view a lot better. And the other thing that I will highly recommend you to do is that especially for fact tables, you have to write some notes and explain the user that this table has been loaded at what granularity. Once you happen to write some notes, let's say on the sales table or the budget table or the purchase table, and you mention what the granularity of the table is, these notes can then be taken a look at once the user is working in Power BI. Now this could be you yourself as a developer or anybody else. If you hover on top of the table, your notes that you wrote in Power Query are going to now be seen in Power BI. This is very, very helpful. One very important thing that a lot of people not end up doing is not renaming the columns, especially if the column names are not friendly with the end user. Think about it. You have a sales table and one of the sales column, which contains the sales amount, is mentioned as dw.factinternetsales underscore dollar dollar amount. Now, this happens to be a terrible name. Instead, what I'll recommend you to do is just rename this particular column as sales amount, which is going to be a lot easier for you to write your DAX calculations and anybody taking a model to even understand what this column stands for. So please make it a habit of removing all the jargons from the names and make absolutely clean and clear column names. Once you've done your Power Query work, you then obviously move the data to Power BI and you start writing DAX calculations on top of that. Now, there are two things that I want you to keep in mind. One is that you have to learn to write simple DAX. Don't make your DAX overtly complicated. Most likely, if your DAX is becoming complicated, the problem is not with the DAX itself. The problem perhaps lies with the data model. And I'm gonna go back to my first point is you have to start to think about data modeling first. You have to think about data model as the first thing that you do and then end up writing simple DAX to write your calculation. Now, even if your calculations are becoming hard and if your data model is simple, then you have to think of creative ideas of solving your problems using a modeling approach, using relationships, or some creative table solutions rather than writing very complicated DAX. So get in the habit of writing simple DAX statements to do your calculations. Still continuing our journey with DAX, the next thing that you have to do in your models is write some notes. After you have finished all your calculations, you have to write some notes. At the moment, you remember what your calculation is. You obviously understand the logic because you're in the weeds solving the problem. So you understand every last bit of comma that you've added to your calculation. But two months from now, on a Friday evening, you open up the model to make some changes and you will have no freaking idea 
what you were doing back then, and what is the meaning of this particular calculations. So be very explicit in writing the notes that you have to put inside of your calculations to explain your future self that what was the logic that you were trying to build. And in case you've built any peculiar calculation or anything that you have done, please write notes to explain to yourself as to why did you do that you are going to thank yourself. I can promise you that. The next thing that I see a lot of people not doing is making use of model views, especially when your models have become very complicated. Imagine a model which has like 35 different tables and many of them are fact tables, then you have dimension tables and then you have a flow snowflake dimension on top of a dimension table. Now, how do you handle such complicated relationships? What you do is you build model views. You can actually build model views to segregate your models one apart from the other. And this even gives you a clearer picture as to how the model is working. I will highly recommend that you use model views for very, very complicated model. This is going to make your life so, so much simpler. Finally, we come to the last one, which is visualizations, which is everybody's favorite. Who doesn't want to make pretty visualizations and impress the boss? So we'll talk about that. The only thing that I want to talk about in visualizations is that the design should be focused on enhancing the quality or the comprehension of the insights, not the other way around. Your report should not be filled with design and no insights. It should be other way around. Your report should have very valuable insights and the design just takes the comprehension of those insights to the next level. Now, in order to understand this, there is a very interesting principle called the CRAP principle, C-R-A-P, where the C stands for contrast, R stands for repetition, A stands for alignment, and P stands for proximity. I'm gonna talk about all of these points briefly, but there is a white paper which happens to be from Lewis University that I'm gonna leave a link in the description of the video that you should definitely read. But nevertheless, the contrast simply means that how are you using contrast, which is the contrast of the color, the contrast of the size, the contrast of the font type and things like that in order to highlight what is important that should stand out from the piece of visual information. That is the meaning of contrast. And after that, we have repetition. Repetition simply means that do you have some standard items that are going to repeat to create consistency over and over again in your report? These could be header items, the places where you put your, um, let's say the most important metrics, the card visuals, the, the uh, slicer settings, and things like that. These are all the things that can be repeated over multiple pages to create a consistency or to create a repeatable experience for the end user. For example, if you're trying to to highlight any particular thing or a particular matrix, you have to repeat that highlighting technique over and over and over again through multiple pages to create the same effect that you're trying to highlight on this thing. And that is the meaning of repetition. The next comes is the alignment, which is super important. If you want to build something good that looks presentable and clean and structured to the eye, you have to align it well. Now, Power BI has a lot of alignment options, which you can also do it through the mouse, but I will highly recommend the built-in alignment option that helps you align the objects very, very quickly. Align top, left, right, center, middle align, distribute horizontally and distribute vertically. Please use them. They are going to save you a ton of time. And the final one, which is a very, very important one, is the P of the crap, which is proximity. What do I mean by that? Let's just say that you have a particular chart which is trying to show some top end calculation. Now those top end calculations has a slicer built on top of that, which is where the user can pick up how many top items do I want to select. Now, if this slicer was kept far away on the top right corner of the dashboard, it is very hard to understand that that slicer is going to start to reflect the change in this visual. So anything that relates to one another has to be proximate or close to that. If that is not close to that, the user's eye would not be able to judge that these two things are proximate and hence these two things work together. So make sure the things that relate to one another, for example, labels on top of the charts, uh, figures in UST thousands and things like that. Slicer that connects to a specific chart. These things have high proximity and I will highly recommend that you keep these things together.